Well, good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the virtual Hudson Institute. I'm Todd Lindbergh. I'm a senior fellow here. Today, we're going to have a book conversation. Uh, the author is Michael Kimmage. He's a historian at Catholic University and the author of this book, The Abandonment of the West, a history of uh, the history of an idea in American foreign policy. Uh, also joining us for the discussion is Peter Berkowitz, an old friend of mine and uh, now director of policy planning at the State Department. He's the Ted and Diane Toby Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution as well. Michael, let's begin. I mean, I'll tell you this. You, you sent me an email more or less out of the blue a couple months before this book appeared saying um, maybe we would do an event. And I uh, saw the title of the book, The Abandonment of the West. Uh, and I was so struck by it that I uh, immediately uh, fired off an email to see if I could review it for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, such is the arresting nature of this title, the abandonment uh, of the West. Let's uh, let's start there. Uh, maybe we should start actually with the uh, creation of the West, or uh, uh, or how exactly this idea came to prominence, uh, and and then uh, let's uh, take it up uh, through more or less this this period of abandonment. Uh, wh wh what do we mean by the West, and why does that matter in foreign policy? Well, let me first start by, by thanking you, Todd, very much for the invitation to appear in your virtual seminar and also to say that it's an, it's an honor to be with Peter Berkowitz, um, who's a, a scholar I've long admired and uh, who's the director of an office of which I'm a kind of alumnus, so to speak, from 2014 to 2016 was myself at the Office of Policy Planning, so it's always wonderful to be in touch uh, with this office and <clears throat> best case scenario, my comments will be of some use to the work that, uh, that Peter is doing. Um, let me try to break down the question because it's a big one that you uh, just asked about. You said the creation of the West to start with a definition uh, and then get, get into the notion of abandonment. The West can be defined many, many different ways. Uh, and even in the mind of a single intellectual scholar policymaker, there can be multiple uh, and uh, perhaps even conflicting definitions. So it's a slippery concept uh, at best. I made a choice in my book to define it in a particular way, although I try to engage uh, some of the other definitions that are out there. And what I emphasized was a Euro-American narrative uh, of liberty that really begins in the 18th century, although you don't have the use of the word the West uh, all that prominently until the late 19th century. Uh, in terms of the creation on the American side, and, and each European uh, country would be different in this respect, and certainly Turkey and Russia would be very different in terms of their stories uh, of the West. But the American story of the West uh, I think it begins to coalesce, not completely, but it begins to coalesce around the time of the First World War, uh, where there's a notion of uh, a certain alliance structure uh, rooted in Western Europe, but also a narrative of liberty. That's certainly uh, something that uh, Woodrow Wilson tries to peg uh, to the First World War, but it doesn't gel in terms of domestic politics or American foreign policy uh, in the teens or 20s, and doesn't quite gel uh, in the 1930s either, because there are multiple challenges to the West that are there on the horizon, but it's not until Pearl Harbor that the U.S. is, you know, sort of pushed into the fray. Uh, and so the real date of creation, sort of echoing uh, the title of Dean Acheson's uh, autobiography present at the creation, the real time of creation, I think, is probably 1945, uh, where you have, <clears throat> again, this Euro-American narrative uh, of liberty. Uh, it's very much uh, a part of American foreign policy at that point, and then the Cold War. Uh, does a great deal to intensify uh, the need for a West and the American commitment, ongoing commitment to the uh, to the West. We can certainly return to the 40s and 50s. There's a lot more to say about those decades uh, uh, regarding the U.S. and the West. But uh, in terms of abandonment, uh, what I have in mind is two things. And let me first stress that what I don't argue in the book and don't myself believe is that the West is in decline. I think that that's a different story that's been told from Spengler onwards by many different uh, philosophers, intellectuals, that's not my uh, contention. I think in terms of raw military and economic power, uh, the West remains uh, much preeminent. So by abandonment, what I have in mind is a certain sense of confusion uh, over the narrative, over the core principles, uh, and what the commitment is to those principles. And in a nutshell, I see a danger on both the right and the left. I'll start with the left and then conclude with the, uh, with the right. On the left, there is, I think, to go back to my graduate school days, a hermeneutics of suspicion. Uh, there's a sense that the West is reducible to empire, to racism, uh, 
uh, to a negative story. That's certainly a true story, but uh, not the only story of the West. Uh, and here you get almost an inversion of the earlier narrative, which emphasized liberty. Uh, the left's narrative of the West, academic left's narrative of the West, emphasizes uh, oppression uh, and inequality. Uh, and in the book, I focus on the figure of Edward Said and his uh, his study Orientalism from the late 1970s and the impact that had uh, on the academy. But I think also on the right, um, there's a sort of polarization or there's a, a, a partisan uh, aspect of the discourse on the West that begins, according to the argument of, of my book, with James Burnham and his 1964 study, The Suicide of the West, where uh, the enemy at, the, at that time for Burnham is really as much American liberals or liberalism uh, as it is the Soviet Union. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that sort of point of view, I think, intensifies on the right over time. Ronald Reagan tried to, you know, so I think find a certain amount of balance with that. Uh, and then in the 90s and more recently, uh, there's been, you know, sort of heavily partisan spirit on the right. Uh, and there too, you see a sort of diminishing potential for a bipartisan sort of broader cultural commitment to the West, and that puts us sort of where we are at the present moment. Yeah, I, I, and where we are at the present moment is actually with uh, a lot of people who've uh, taken to the streets in protest, uh, talking about uh, systematic racism, uh, endemic in American society, uh, and also extending to the history of the United States, uh, the impulse now to pull down not only the uh, uh, statues of uh, Confederate generals, uh, but also perhaps um, George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who knows who all. And uh, what do you make of that? Well, um, you know, the protests are, I think, a larger story than the monuments, of course. Uh, uh, and there is, I think, a very dignified aspect to many of the protests and the issues are not so much symbolism or identity politics, but you know, sort of core issues of, of tolerance and race relations in the U.S. But uh, in some ways, uh, it evokes my, my book for me. I suppose that's inevitable. But I begin, as you know, the first chapter is titled The Colombian Republic. Uh, and so the creation of the West, which I think does begin in the 1890s and early 20th century, coincides with a moment of great euphoric celebration of the figure of Christopher Columbus. So this is the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, the World's Columbian uh, Exposition. You have the 400th uh, anniversary in 1892. You have Columbus Circle that's put up and, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, very, very broad celebration uh, of Columbus. Uh, and uh, there, was, there was, I think, something dangerous in that celebration. I think it was uh, a celebration that overlooked the issue of segregation uh, and even Columbus, what he's doing there at the beginning of the American narrative, it makes a kind of sense, uh, but uh, in some ways not ideal. So I'm sympathetic uh, up to a point with the de desire to revi revise and to sort of find a new narrative. I conclude the book uh, with the construction of the African American History Museum on the Mall uh, and argue that this post is perhaps a new uh, kind of West, a celebration of freedom and self-government, but one that's uh, interracial uh, or post-racial in some ways. Uh, but of course, the tearing down of statues uh, is a potentially very negative development. It's uh, an effort to erase history as opposed to contending with history. Uh, and I think that there's a kind of nihilistic uh, energy at the edges of this movement to tear down statues, which, uh, which seems quite worrisome uh, and, uh, and, and, and worth opposing. So it's the kinds of debates that we've been having for 20, 30 years, I think, since the culture wars of the 1980s. So it's not entirely new, uh, but there does seem to be a new uh, intensity at the moment, a new fervor. Yeah, uh, let me uh, bring Peter into the discussion. Peter, you're, uh, among other things, in your current government responsibilities, you're the executive secretary of uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's Commission on Unalienable Rights. And uh, that, I think, is uh, uh, an effort to look at the past uh, of the United States in order to retrieve uh, some some of its basic principles, the basic principles of the founding of the country, uh, but also uh, perhaps uh, to uh, acknowledge that one of the more impressive achievements of the founding of this country was to create a kind of self-critical mechanism for uh, the extension of the promise of the founding uh, to groups who were then uh, quite unjustly excluded. So why don't I, uh, I why don't I turn to you and ask you uh, what you think the condition of the West is at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first, I want to say it's uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be to be here with both of you. Uh, Michael's book is uh, is wonderful work of intellectual history, and I must say uh, 
very rare these days, combination of history, culture, ideas and foreign affairs. Uh, and uh, I've learned a lot and will take what I, I certainly will take what I've learned uh, back to the office. And, uh, and I must say I also learned from, uh, from Todd's uh, subtle essay on the book in the Wall Street Journal. So thank you both. Thanks, Todd, for hosting this. Um, I'm delighted to speak about the Commission on Unalienable Rights, but I do want to say a word about um, where Michael uh, ended his book on uh, on the National Mall. Um, I think uh, I think that's ex a, a great place to have ended the book with an uh, account of the contribution to the Ma National Mall, which means in a contribution to the national understanding that we get from having there. Uh, the National Mu Museum for African American History and Culture. What's very important about Michael's account, though, is, of course, that the National Mall is home to both that museum and the Washington Monument and the other memorials and statutes to American history. Um, it seems to me that's the proper spirit. It's always been the proper spirit in which we ought to understand uh, the American constitutional tradition. That is, in light of our founding principles and promises, but with absolutely open eyes to the departures from those principles, beginning with the great evil at the nation's founding of, uh, of slavery. So, uh, um, so especially where Michael ends, uh, I'm in great uh, agreement. And yes, Todd, um, I think it is fair to say that the Commission on unalienable rights uh, has as one of its purposes to help us understand both the soaring promises at the founding and the struggle, the, the, the country's struggle over the course of now almost 250 years uh, to, to realize those principles, to understand the implications latent in those principles, to create a country consistent with the promise of unalienable rights. Again, I emphasize struggle. Um, another part I should mention of the Commission on Unalienable Rights is to think about uh, the commitments that the United States took on in 1948 when we voted approval of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Eleanor Roosevelt played such an important role uh, in drafting. Um, there too, we see a struggle. The world in 1948, uh, no more perfectly embodied the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights than did the United States in 1776. One could say today, just as one could, one notes departures uh, today as well on, uh, on both scores. In that light, it seems to me the history of the United States is a salutary and instructive history for the world as the world struggles, as we in the United States struggle to promote a world more in line with the yardstick, the standard that we approved of at the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, we do so in light of the yardstick, the standard that, um, that the United States uh, proclaimed on July 4th, 1776. Um, I could say more about the, the commission, but why don't I pause there? Well, that's a good place to pause. Uh, we've made it, uh, uh, we, we, we've sort of been back and forth on, uh, the uh, origins, uh, of the, the promise of the United States, the uh, ways in which uh, the promise was uh, not kept for any periods, uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and now let's uh, take uh, another step. And uh, what, what, what is the f situation of the West at the moment? Is there, is there something that is self-consciously Western about the West now? Uh, or does it uh, has it really been uh, abandoned once and for all, Michael? I don't think it's been abandoned once and for all. I think that uh, we probably want to disentangle uh, two separate issues at the moment. I mean, since we are speaking with the director of the Office of Policy Planning, there's the geopolitical West, there's the foreign policy uh, set of concerns, uh, and there there are no doubt many difficulties at the moment. But I think the transatlantic relationship. Uh, is going to carry on. I don't think that it's uh, uh, show signs of of of, of nose diving. I mean, I think that there's turbulence at the moment, but uh, uh, you know, I think there I'm relatively optimistic. I think in terms of culture and ideas, uh, I have more worries. Uh, I think it's very difficult to tell the story of the West at the moment. 
I mean that broadly. I tried in my book, but uh, uh, in the broader culture, that's a difficult enterprise. Uh, it's difficult to get consensus and agreement, and that really matters, of course, for foreign policy, because if you have you know, the sort of bipartisan agreement that was there in the 40s and 50s, I think the protagonist of my book, it's fair to say, is Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, and that's in part because he was able to unify so many things. He brought the Democratic and Republican parties closer together in foreign policy. He was president of Columbia University. He had a connection to universities and, of course, his military career. So he sort of unified these institutions. Uh, and that feels harder to find uh, at the present moment. And then there's just the climate of distraction. We can look to ideology, but one of the things I note in the conclusion of my book is that we're moving further and further away from the culture of the book. And I think the West at its best has always been a textual community. That's what makes it a community of principle and not a, uh, an ethnic community. Uh, and those books are sort of fading away, it feels to me. Uh, and it's not just that the universities are less committed to teaching them. That, that may be true, uh, but we're all, I think, uh, sort of falling away from, uh, from books to a degree. And without that, we're not going to have the West that we need. Uh, and that's maybe in some ways my most, uh, my most urgent concern, just uh, the basic intellectual commitment to this, uh, to this tradition and to, uh, you know, sort of upholding it, modifying it, correcting it. Uh, and passing it along, I think there I feel uh, relatively pessimistic at the moment. But it's, that to me is not a left-right pessimism, that's sort of, uh, if one can put it this way, an intellectual pessimism. Mm. And, you know, sort of a need to bring these ideas uh, and to find a place for them, however we can do it uh, in the broader culture. Peter, you've written a lot about what you've uh, described as um, an unwillingness on the part of the uh, contemporary university to teach the basic principles of uh, uh, the founding of the United States, uh, the principles of liberty, et cetera. You want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, thanks. And I, I really do want to pick up where, where Michael left off. <coughs> um, uh, one of the very important contributions of his book is to emphasize the connection between the conduct of foreign policy in the United States um, and the quality of higher education. That actually has two aspects. Uh, one aspect is the aspect of citizens and what policies they will support or not support. But another aspect is the education of foreign policy experts, um, what policies they will adopt and push, which ones they will overlook. Um, uh, Michael in his book mentions, of course, uh, George Kennan, the founding director of the policy planning staff. And in his two most famous writings, uh, the Long Telegram of 1946 and the follow-up article in Foreign Affairs on the, Intel on the Sources of Soviet Conduct, uh, Kennan makes a very important point at the end of both articles. And this is, remember, early in the Cold War, actually at a time before many people knew that we had entered into a Cold War. Uh, Kennan says, one of the conditions for the United States to prevail in the uh, conflict with, uh, uh, with the Soviet Union, with communism, would be maintaining a certain political cohesiveness. A political co cohesiveness that was built on a dedication to American principles. Um, like Michael, uh, uh, I think, I see American education as having a role in um, in providing an education in those principles, which is not cheerleading, which is not uncritical, which it does not cover over um, evils and injustices that were per that have been perpetrated by the country, even in the name of those principles, and nevertheless also doesn't um, doesn't uh, suppress the genuine achievements that have that uh, that the United States has made under those principles. But for a long time now. Uh, Michael Dates does date it to uh, more or less the 1960s. The United States, uh, uh, especially the higher education system, but now percolating throughout the system, has not been doing a good job of teaching those principles. As Michael emphasizes, a corrective was surely in order from simple celebration to telling the full truth. But we have, in my judgment, wildly overcorrected such that, uh, such that the universities are not merely teaching, but promulgating a, a one-sided view of American history, which has uh, causing us to lose sight 
of the principles that are uh, that form the basis of this country and that that ignorance has um, the the ignorance that I fear that the university universities are, are fostering has to go back to the beginning of my comment to consequences one it deprives the citizenry of the kind of knowledge they we need to make informed decisions but it also deprives it seems to me um, foreign policy experts the kind of knowledge they need uh, what one concluding point on this set of remarks the sad truth is that the kind of history that Michael provides us in the abandonment of the West is increasingly rare in the universities. Whole body, which sees the links between, again, ideas, culture, uh, geopolitics. Uh, we, we need, as Michael lays out, a, uh, a, a, um, a modest, from my point of view, a modest core curriculum at the end of his book. I fully sign on to it even though the prospects for adoption of his modest core curriculum, which focuses on the American political tradition with eyes wide open, uh, I think has unfortunately little chance of being uh, adopted in the near term. But those of us who care both about education and about American foreign policy should work hard for, um, for its adoption. But I wanna make a second point, if I may, about that education. Um, I, I'm all for um, broadening even core curriculum beyond the study of what we've traditionally called the West, to beyond the West, to other civilizations. Um, indeed, I think that is an imperative of what we learn from the Western tradition, that one must be an educated person, understand other lands and cultures. But at the universities today, I, I see a um, multiculturalism that fails in that crucial regard. I'll take just one example. Uh, foreign language study. In the 50s, um, that first generation of foreign policy experts who realized that we were in a Cold War devoted hundreds of millions of uh, dollars of federal money to encouraging the serious study of Russian, Chinese, other foreign languages. Today at American universities, we have, uh, when we have a, a requirement to study a foreign language, it's usually a very feeble requirement, one year, maybe two years. Nobody who, who merely uh, meets that minimum is capable of conducting diplomacy in a foreign language. I'm so serious about the study of other cultures and civilizations that I would make it mandatory, especially if you're studying politics or culture or sociology to go beyond, go beyond mastering Edward Said's Orientalism and actually learn our real foreign languages, learn Chinese, learn Russian, learn Arabic, learn Hindi, learn Farsi, and many of the other foreign languages of both of our, of our rivals, of our competitors, and of our friends and, and potential friends. This is hugely important. I regard it as a, not only a geopolitical imperative, but a educational imperative of the first order. Todd, if I could just add something very, very briefly to what to what Peter just said, I think not only are universities not doing enough to link the humanities to citizenship, it's not that uh, you would want universities to be providing some sort of uncritical uh, support to various American foreign policy positions. That's, I think, deeply undesirable in a democracy, but uh, grounding citizenship in, in, in humanistic studies, but I think also foreign policy types, to speak uh, very broadly, uh, tend toward the technocratic. If you go back to Kennan, he really did uh, value literature, he valued philosophy, uh, he writes about spiritual matters in both of those documents that you mentioned, the Long Telegram, the X article, the sort of state of Russian spirituality, which for him was a kind of data point uh, for American foreign policy formation. And I think the foreign policy types also need to re-engage with the humanities. They shouldn't wait for the universities to catch up with them uh, because they may not, but uh, there needs to be more, I think, emphasis placed. I agree about foreign languages, of course, but uh, uh, just the value of the humanities to the foreign policy imagination. I think that could be brought forward uh, as well. And also, without that imagination, I don't, don't think that the West is going to, you know, sort of have all that much traction.
uh, if it's simply a matter of commercial interests and keeping the NATO border secure, uh, in, a, in a certain sense, that's too little. Uh, the West needs to have more to it, and that's going to come, I think, from uh, from the humanities, or has historically come uh, from the humanities. But I think it's a matter, in some ways, of this world of humanities and the world of policymakers meeting each other halfway, and, and both sides, the academic and the foreign policy side, need to uh, do more on that account. So you're both making a case for a broadly um, liberal arts curriculum, and uh, I think also making a point that um, that we are we are far away from that tradition. And uh, yeah, it's the tradition in which I went to school. Uh, it's, I imagine it's the case with uh, the both of you as well. Um, I don't know what the path back is uh, to uh, liberal arts uh, curriculum in that sense. And uh, if you can give me any uh, practical pointers for the encouragement of this development, I would very much like to hear them. Uh, the, the, uh, who, who's going to volunteer? <laughs> uh, happy, to, happy to jump in. Um, uh, we, we can begin with uh, we can begin with the political sphere. It seems to me that um, uh, it's important for uh, uh, for both uh, foreign policy regions and educational reasons for for political leaders to uh, champion champion uh, the principles of the American constitutional tradition. Um, I believe that, uh, by the way, but when I say champion, I don't mean engage in triumphalist or uh, self-congratulatory uh, spectacles. I mean state very clearly what those principles are, what their contribution uh, has been. Uh, we don't. We haven't said this enough, and uh, uh, Actually, this is a point that I, I would have emphasized more, uh, Michael, in, in your book. Um, you speak often about um, liberty and self-government in uh, uh, in the Western tradition. You trace that back to uh, to the classical world, and that's right. Um, but a change occurs in the understanding of liberty and self-government government in the modern era. A principle is introduced into political ideas that one doesn't find among the Greeks and one doesn't find among the Romans. And that's the principle that Jefferson underscores in the Declaration. And that is the natural freedom and equality of each person. The Greeks didn't teach that, the Romans didn't teach that. But we teach that. That's fundamental to our understanding of liberty, of self-government, and the rule of law. We need to hear this from political leaders. Um, if I, if I may say so, uh, if you look at the speeches of, um, Secretary of Secretary of State Pompeo over the last two years, you will see this idea uh, emphasized in, uh, in speech after speech. And to return to the commission, uh, I believe one of the reasons that Secretary Pompeo created the Commission on Unalienable Rights is precisely because he wanted uh, to see American foreign policy rerouted in this, um, this constitutional beginning of the country. Liberty and self-government, but the specifically modern interpretation of a, of a freedom that inheres in all persons just because they're human beings. But I have, I've noticed, Todd, dodged your question. I've only spoken about politics and what Secretary Pompeo has done. What, what else can be done for colleges and universities? Well, um, I think we should do what we, uh, what what living in a liberal democracy, a democracy that protects freedom, allows us to do. I would like to see civil society uh, undertake even more aggressive action to create alternative institutions which carry forward uh, the great tradition of liberal education. Uh, we already see this, uh, a variety of philanthropists, a variety of think tanks with um, slowly uh, uh, different political perspectives are recognizing that there is a, a hunger for liberal education and are providing some of that liberal education. Right now, it's still only a drop in the bucket, but, um, but uh, if our universities continue, in my, again, in my assessment, to deprive students of access to the fullness of their tradition, um, let's see, uh, Let's see the American entrepreneurial spirit. Let's see the, the, the room for engaged citizens to act in their country. 
let's see all of that um, activated and see uh, alternatives, uh, providing young men and women the opportunity to, uh, to understand their tradition. And uh, just the final point, again, for me, uh, to understand their tradition, which is the American tradition, the broader tradition of freedom, Western civilization more broadly, which has roots in both the classical world and the biblical world, to understand that tradition, to understand the variety of perspectives, the clashing points of view, is to learn the imperative to understand the world beyond Western civilization, what we've commonly called Western civilization. So um, I, uh, I, I do not see uh, the concept. In fact, I think one has, one encounters a false dichotomy between so-called multi uh, multicultural education and study of, of the West. Properly understood, just as knowing oneself begins inside and, and blossoms outward, we can't know ourselves unless we know other people, so too with uh, education. We begin in, uh, in the United States, in Western civilization, and we understand the imperative for the enrichment of our education uh, to study beyond Western civilization. Let me give, uh, uh, in a way, a smaller answer to the question uh, than Peter has just given. Uh, I think that to revive the liberal arts, um, what one does is you you just try to embody them. Uh, you write uh, uh, with reference to the books that matter to you. Uh, you try to create an aura of excitement around them. Uh, you try to learn from them. Uh, you grapple from them. I mean, lots of people have been going back to James Baldwin's essays in the last couple of weeks. I think that that's wonderful. It's, it's a great way to respond to the crisis that the country is currently in, in terms of, um, you know, sort of racial justice, racial equality. That's an absolutely correct instinct. And by all means, to Du Bois and to many other writers, Frederick Douglass, who have so much to say uh, to us at the moment uh, on these topics, that I think is the spirit uh, of the liberal arts. And to go back to Kennan, who came up earlier, you know, Kenning goes to Princeton in the early 20s where he doesn't get a great books education. I'm sure he got a good education there. He was thoroughly miserable uh, as an undergraduate at, at Princeton. Uh, but if you read his diaries, you see that he kind of gives himself an education. You know, it's he himself who packs his bag with Thomas Mann and Spangler and goes uh, on a road trip through Europe uh, as an undergraduate. And he reads those books. I mean, he did indeed have the languages, German and, and eventually Russian, uh, that opened those worlds to him. But he kind of did it on his own. Uh, and then when he writes his policy, you know, writings in the 40s and 50s, his great text, you can just see that it's given him so much. But he sort of went out in pursuit of those of those riches and he kept them with him. And I think that in the end is, is sort of the ultimate recipe because you can put books on a syllabus, you can require that students learn them, you can do everything in the classroom and it can still not gel. Uh, and then you have these extraordinary students who come and find their way uh, to the great books sort of by their own uh, by their own devices. The door should always be open to that, but uh, I think by embodying the spirit of the liberal arts, a great deal is done uh, towards sustaining and perpetuating them. I sometimes worry that the constant rhetoric of crisis and uh, you know disintegration becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling pro prophecy. There should, I think, be an, uh, an atmosphere of enthusiasm uh, around these books, and I think that can be infectious. Certainly, I know from the students that I teach that if you come in with a certain amount of enthusiasm, half the students that you teach are going to pick up on that and sort of run with it. So, um, you know, uh, Spengler is sort of a, a, a leitmotif in my book and his, his gloom, one of the arguments I make is that traditionally the American commitment to the West is not pessimistic, it's more optimistic than pessimistic. Uh, and I would sort of stand by that when it comes to the liberal arts. Todd, yeah. Todd may, may I pick up on, uh, on Michael's comment? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I want to say I agree, uh, agree uh, strongly about, um, one aspect of if, uh, either reviving, preserving liberal education is uh, teachers like, uh, like Michael who embody, uh, embody liberal education in the classroom. Um, this echoes or refers back to something Michael said uh, earlier about w what is it that civic education consists in? It doesn't consist in preaching or uh, hectoring. What it, uh, what it consists in partly, is modeling the spirit of liberal education, which means transmitting knowledge and encouraging independence of mind in regard to first, 
the essential curriculum, which uh, I agree with Michael, has to do with, um, with the American political tradition. Also, I want to pick up a comment that Michael makes at the end of his book, where he is a little more uh, pessimistic when he thinks uh, when he's thinking about um, uh, what uh, the internet and social media are doing to uh, to the love of books. Uh, I worry too, but uh, internet and social media also give us opportunities for reaching wider audiences that we've never had before. Uh, so I think we should uh, we should use every opportunity to to remind uh, our students, our fellow citizens, citizens of the educational riches that are now available to them with two clicks. And if I may, Todd, uh, one example, um, as part of the commission, the work of the Commission on Unalienable Rights, we are translating into um, a variety of foreign languages, starting, as you could imagine, with Chinese, Russian, Arabic, Persian, Hindi, Spanish, and French, classics of freedom and democracy. Uh, many of the documents that are, are soon to be released report will, uh, will make mention of. Why? Because we believe the documents that have had a great impact on us in our tradition are of, are of relevance to people who live uh, in different countries and who speak different languages. And we want young men and young women Googling, uh, for whatever reason, freedom, liberty, democracy, struggle in, in, uh, in their own language to be able to come across uh, these documents. We, we will also uh, be translating the report into critical foreign languages. And uh, the, the idea here, this, uh, this takes us to a, um, a theme toward the end of Michael's book, is uh, the, the idea here is that we also make a mistake in drawing too sharp a distinction, I believe, between a devotion to liberty, self-government, and the rule of law, and a devotion to um, uh, independent and sovereign nation states. We, we believe that the United States, can, by looking into its tradition, finds, can find renewed vigor in its commitment to unalienable rights, uh, what we tend to refer to today as, uh, as human rights, and we believe that example can inspire other countries to look to their traditions and find resources for, uh, for a similar commitment to the rights that inhere in all persons. Yes, Peter, what uh, are you translating? Oh, we, uh, we have, uh, we've begun modestly. Uh, the, uh, you will find on the State Department's website right now, translations of uh, the Declaration of the, the direct, the direct, sorry, the Declaration of Independence, as well as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of the Constitution, separately uh, the Bill of Rights, the original Constitution, also the full Constitution with the Bill of Rights, uh, the Gettysburg Address, um, important statements uh, about women's rights from Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, Susan B. Anthony, um, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, uh, Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail, but that's that's just the start. As as I don't have to tell both of you, uh, things can sometimes proceed slowly within the State Department. But we, it turns out, we do have a devoted core of translators at work. And thanks again to the wonders of the internet, we can continue to add to this list of classics of freedom of, and democracy translated into a variety of foreign languages. And the report itself eventually will be translated into. Um, a variety of foreign languages. Thanks. Michael, you said something interesting, which was to sort of begin where your passion is. And one of the things that's somewhat noticeable in your book is that you seem to have something of a passion for architecture. Uh, you write a fair bit about architecture and what it says about us, uh, about, about the people who are building it, about the people who respond to it. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, for one, this is it's pretty typical when, when, when historians write about civilization. Uh, whether it's textbooks or or, uh, or more ambitious books, uh, architecture very often comes up as a kind of icon uh, of, of civilization. Or if you even think of the covers of books, you know, Western civilization with a picture of the Parthenon uh, on the cover, it's a very typical association. So it's certainly not um, original with me to make this uh, connection, but it, it uh, uh, 
you know, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's helpful because civic architecture is always contested. It's always difficult to pursue. The financing is always uh, tangled up. Uh, the story of every monument and sort of major building in Washington is a story of, of struggle, to put it, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, but that's because these are you know, sort of highly representative structures. Uh, and so I'm just intrigued by the way in which we as a, as a country, and that's been reinforced, of course, in the last couple of weeks in this contest over statues and, and, and narrative, but how we tell our story. Uh, and I think in Washington, you've got kind of the good, bad, and the ugly in that respect. And you've got a lot of awful buildings uh, in the center of Washington, uh, some of which are just ugly. I single out the Ronald Reagan uh, International Trade Building as, as sort of gargantuan uh, and sort of ugly, some of which I find kind of nice, but also meaningless. So uh, you know, the the new National Gallery Building by IMP, I think it's a lovely building, but to have it on the mall is a bit of a shame because that building could be anywhere. Uh, and then you have what I find the really extraordinary buildings, the, one that, the ones that tell uh, stories, Library of Congress for sure. I think also Union Station, you know, completed 19... Uh, 08, and a building that comes directly out of the Chicago World's Fair, and, you know, Daniel Burnham, uh, the architect, and it tells a very distinct civilizational story. There's no question about that. The modeling on the bows of Caracalla and that bold effort in Washington to kind of rebuild a modern Rome uh, on the Potomac or what had once been the Tiber, uh, the Tiber Creek. Uh, and then, of course, the Vietnam Memorial says a great deal. I find it exceptional. I'd love to be down there on Memorial today and to see the soldiers <laughs> around it. Uh, there's the less affirmative version of the story, of course, uh, more challenging uh, and more critical. And I conclude, as we've already discussed with the African American History Museum, and this is something to, that echoes a point that Peter makes. So it's there on the mall, very close to the White House, a uh, very prime piece of real estate. Uh, and it's in architectural or, you know, sort of visual dialogue with the Washington Monument. And in fact, the architect of the African American History Museum put the angles on the side of the building at 17 degrees, which is the exact angle uh, at the top of the Washington Monument. So your eye is supposed to make a connection between these two buildings. And that seems to me uh, one of the great achievements of them all, because after all, the last thing we'd want to do is take down the Washington Monument. That's self erasure. Um, but there is, of course, the legacy of Washington as a slaveholder uh, and, and Jefferson as well. And uh, you know, that's uh, a reality that must be, you know, sort of constantly uh, dealt with. So I, I especially appreciate the dialogue that, that sort of happens on the mall uh, as one building adds to another. But I love the buildings that tell a story. In some ways, an underappreciated place in Washington that doesn't show up in my book is the Freedom Plaza that Robert Venturi put up on Pennsylvania Avenue, which is this wonderful mixture of images and texts and the great buildings of the country and some you know, sort of, uh, in a way, all the phrases and citations that you would need to understand the American political tradition, and you can kind of walk uh, over it with a stroller or have an ice cream on top of it and, you know, look at it carefully or just uh, uh, walk past it. But that effort on the part of Washington to tell its story, uh, I find remarkable. Uh, and, you know, Peter will, of course, know this well because he's there uh, very often. I think the State Department that was finished in, in January of 1963 is sort of a failure in this regard. I, I don't know what story it's telling. It's, it's, it's a nice building in some respects. The top floors are sort of pretty, uh, lots of window space uh, on the inside of the building, but it, it fails. And what I especially enjoyed is this one statue of Montesquieu there uh, on the first floor, which nobody knows is Montesquieu. You just walk right by it and sort of lost there. He's a great person to have in the State Department, very much in the spirit of the building, the best traditions of American foreign policy. But, you know, if you're going to put Montesquieu there, make it the Montesquieu Hall and, and you know, make it clear to the people that uh, this is a tribute to, uh, to the spirit of laws and such. But uh, the State Department doesn't, uh, doesn't quite succeed. But I, I, I do love this effort at storytelling uh, and how vibrant and ongoing uh, and, uh, and, and really meaningful uh, it is with all the failures. I mean, the successes far uh, outweigh them. And the National Mall is uh, really, I think, one of the best places, not just to understand the national story, but sort of to feel it. Uh, and then, of course, when you think that that's where inaugurations take place and uh, other important events, that only adds to the, adds to the mix. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking, uh, there two ways we might actually kind of recover uh, the sense of the West. And one would be the one we've been talking about, which is a sort of conscious reaffirmation of the great principles that um, were forwarded uh, in our own history and carried forward uh, by others through the 20th century as well. Uh, and another, uh, perhaps less attractive way uh, might be because uh, of a certain 
peer competitor emerging uh, in American foreign policy, namely China. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things that's taken place over the past couple of years in Washington is I think a gradual uh, and maybe even um, in some cases sudden uh, awareness that uh, perhaps two generations worth of uh, speculation almost about the future of China, uh, most of which was premised on the proposition that a China that was getting richer would produce a middle class which would demand greater political rights and accountability from uh, from the political system, uh, that that China is not coming to pass or uh, shows no evidence. Uh, and uh, many uh, people are accordingly kind of recalibrating, asking the question, uh, uh, what should we do? And I don't uh, want to put you in a position of uh, uh, outlining a, a China policy for us in the course of this conversation. But uh, is China different? Is China uh, something distinctly unwestern? Peter? Ah, to me, the question's addressed. Good, good. I'm glad you did not want to put me in the position of outlining a, uh, uh, a China policy. <laughs> well, to. I have no objection. I, I understand. Let, let me offer a few uh, modest remarks on the subject. Um, this goes back, uh, I want to raise um, a, a point about the use of this term uh, Western. In one important sense, uh, it is and always has been misleading. Michael, Michael pointed out you can define Western in many ways. Is it, is it uh, idea, civilization? Is it a geographical place? So, uh, of course, it has an origin. It developed in a place, but it's committed to a set of ideas, even as they develop within through specific peoples and specific national traditions. It's committed to ideas that have, it claims, universal relevance. Uh, so, um, why do I say that here? Because it seems to me um, the challenge presented by uh, China is different from, in a way, bigger than that between the West and another, another civilization. It's a clash which is easily intelligible within uh, terms developed within Western civilization, other civilizations. It's a clash between liberal democracy and autocracy. You're right, Todd, it seems to me that we were, um, we, we have been overly optimistic. Michael discusses this, uh, this in his book. Um, and there is uh, surprisingly, uh, surprisingly significant bipartisan consensus, it seems to me, arising at least, uh, at least on uh, Capitol Hill, about the urgency of what Secretary Pompeo has called, uh, called the China challenge. Um, it seems to me, again, the best way to frame that is uh, liberal democracy ver facing another kind of uh, autocracy, although there is a respect in which the China challenge does, one respect in which it takes us back to uh, Kennan in the beginning of the Cold War, another respect when it's very different. How so? Um, in exploring the sources of Soviet conduct, Kennan makes clear that to understand the Soviet Union, it's not enough to understand Marxism-Leninism, although that, that's crucial. What you must also understand is the continuing influence on the Soviet mind, the, the, the leadership in the Soviet Union of Russian nationalism. Uh, something similar, it seems to me, can be said about uh, the challenge of understanding the China challenge. China is governed by the communist by the uh, Chinese Communist Party. They are proudly, emphatically, dogmatically communist. Just attend to their the party speeches, especially under Xi. But they are also um, also to understand the China challenge. You need to to see the role of Chinese nationalism, or let's call it an extreme form of Chinese nationalism. The approach to the world, the understanding, China's understanding of its place in the world seems to me is best understood um, in terms of a synthesis of, of dogma taken from Marxism, Leninism, and 
a long history of, of Chinese nationalism. So yes, we have to understand that. Once we un understanding their conduct in, their, in light of their ideas helps us understand uh, just how serious uh, the, the China challenge is. Um, and, and I think Justice Kennan, uh, I think I already mentioned this, Justice Kennan emphasized in 1946 and 1947 to meet the Soviet challenge, uh, it would be necessary to um, be around the, our, the principles which distinguish the United States, I think so too today, um, uh, to, to meet this formidable challenge. What is necessary is for the United States once again to understand what distinguishes it from autocracies that's the principle, the ultimate principle of the dignity of the individual, the freedom and equality of all, and the best kind of government, liberal democracy, limited government and rule of law that vindicates, um, that, that shows respect for what, what human beings are. Um, another question would be what international order looks like, but I'll stop there for now. Well, that's fine. I will uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you, Michael. It sounds like, uh... Uh, even in looking abroad, we are looking within. Uh, we're finding some sort of, Peter's finding some sort of uh, uh, strength from the universalism uh, of the principles that, uh, uh, that maybe were uh, first uh, entered into the political world via the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, albeit perfectly uh, vindicated, in fact, uh, far from vindicated. Well, let me uh, try to make three points. Uh, I'll echo in the first one uh, what uh, what Peter said about the sort of disillusionment that uh, <clears throat> the West has had with both China and the Ru and, and Russia, uh, and then I'll speak about the way in which I think the West is sort of useful in a policy sense at the present moment vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China, and then thirdly, um, you know, speak a little bit about alliances and how this uh, I think re relates to the larger question of the, the West. Uh, in competition or in tension with both China uh, and Russia. I think that it wasn't just that we were sort of naive, the phrase that one returns to with China, the earlier phrase is it was supposed to be a responsible stakeholder, it was supposed to sort of join the system, and sometimes it was called the Western system, sometimes it's sort of liberal international order. Um, the West was engaged at times, not always in this, in this discussion about China, but not only was that naive, and it was a similar assumption about Russia that was also naive, what it really underestimated is that in both China and Russia, there's quite a bit of animus against the West. Uh, this goes back in China to the story of empire and the you know, sort of breakup of China, late 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, indeed, Chinese communism is a sort of nationalist answer to that. Uh, and so there's a pleasure, I think, in China in being assertive uh, toward the West. And I think Russia is, is, is in some respects similar, at least Putin's Russia uh, is similar. There's a sense that the West pushed it around, took advantage of it in the 1990s when Russia was weak, and now it's time uh, to be more assertive. So it's necessary if one is inside the West, you don't have to become a Saidian to do this, but uh, it's necessary to recognize where the points of animosity are, where the points of tension are, where the desire for maybe revenge comes into play, or at least for a sort of settling of scores. Uh, and that was underestimated in the past with China and Russia, and I think it's, it's in some ways unavoidable uh, at the present moment. I think when it comes to projecting democracy or projecting Western values, uh, and this is simply a restatement of, of how Kennan, I think, would have put it, the best that we can do is to represent them well at home. I don't think the Chinese or the Russians, this may be uh, you know, not the case for certain NGOs there and certain opposition movements, but in general, China and Russia don't want us to come uh, and reorder their politics and offer some kind of new recipe. Um, as you were saying before, Peter, you translate these documents into different languages and you sort of let them do their work in these other intellectual, political, historical traditions uh, and sort of so be it. So, um, you know, I think there uh, we can show restraint, but it's not giving up the game. Uh, it's sort of representing well uh, what you're able to represent. And if that has an effect over time on new generations in Russia and China and they wish to move more toward a sort of Western system of politics, a more liberal uh, international order, that would, I think, for us be a good. Um, but that's a decision that doesn't really lie uh, in our hands. Finally, just to speak about the thing that does lie in our hands in terms of Russia and China, um, you know, I think the military options that we have for the most part are bad. Uh, these are two nuclear powers that have huge militaries and can certainly stand up for themselves. Uh, but the way to contend with them, I would say, is through uh, our alliances. That's the long-term answer to uh, 
uh, to dealing with these two countries and to some in some ways just managing uh, the differences that we're going to have. And that's I think the the real imperative of foreign pol American foreign policy at the moment is to work on those alliance structures, to improve them, to make them flexible, uh, to give them a popular foundation, whether it's with Japan uh, in uh, in the Pacific or with uh, uh, with the Europeans uh, in other domains. I think that uh, that becomes the kind of long term. Uh, answer. It's meticulous, grueling, in many ways, sort of unpleasant work, alliance maintenance, but uh, I think it's the best tool that we have uh, for sustaining what we think of as the West and uh, at times, if necessary, for, for defending it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, as has been often remarked, uh, the United States has allies. Uh, the Chinese don't really have allies. Uh, Russia doesn't really have allies. Um, and there's uh, something uh, that seems to work uh, among states, even when they're quarreling bitterly, as we, we certainly are with a number of our uh, of our allies at the moment, there seems to be something uh, that uh, binds them a little more tightly, uh, some sense of uh, togetherness. And and I I don't think that it's merely um, uh, a defensive posture, a, a a coming together against some other. Uh, the 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 West, I don't think, is uh, uh, dependent on another for its uh, westernness. Uh, I do think that it is uh, the appeal within of uh, these uh, basic principles of, uh, of liberty, of equality, of uh, dignity, uh, of rights. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is, uh, you know, that is, that's widely held. Uh, it's certainly not uh, the end of history in the uh, sense of the um, actualization of a world of perfect uh, liberal states. Uh, but who's, who's got the contending argument? It, where's, the, where's the other set of principles that, uh, that, that really uh, would cause us to say, you know, we don't really need this liberty business. And we don't really need this uh, freedom business. And uh, the tension between uh, uh, equality and liberty, um, we, can, we can resolve that permanently by getting rid of one or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just not really the, uh, the, the, the place uh, that I think uh, anybody really wants to go. And I, one of the things that's been instructive about, uh, 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 about the protests is how little coherence there is in, in some of it, especially the more egregious uh, statue uh, pulling. Uh, the, 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 it's, it, it's not clear what, um, what the critique is. The, the part of it that is clear, of course, pertains to structural racism, to the police abuse, et cetera. And those are matters that need to be addressed. Uh, but otherwise, you see something that, it, it, that doesn't really speak uh, in, in a coherent fashion. It doesn't really have uh, an argument. What it has is a certain highly developed sense of, uh, of rage. And, uh, and rage uh, is something that you have to contain, uh, but it, uh, I think, is not really uh, an argument. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the, uh, of the hour mark, uh, so I just want to once again thank, uh, thank you both for coming and having this discussion. This was the, uh, the un-Twitter uh, of the day uh, in the sense that uh, it was uh, rich, it was thoughtful, it was not confined to a certain number of uh, characters, et cetera. Uh, so Peter Berkowitz, uh, Director of Policy Planning at the State Department, Michael Kimmage, Professor at Catholic University and author of The Abandonment of the West, which I encourage all who have uh, found this discussion to be interesting uh, to read. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you.